In this session, I will explain the difference between enterprise value multiples and equity value multiples. The assets of a business are mainly financed by debt or equity, and debt investors require their stipulated interest payments and that the loan be repaid. Therefore, debt is always senior to equity, meaning debt holders have the first right to receive any cash flow generated by the business, and the shareholder will get the residual. What's left in the box after paying out everyone else? Let's look at how this flows through to the income statement. Notice operating expenses are paid first, typically to vendors and employees. In any business, employees must be paid first. We ignore depreciation here because it's non-cash. And notice when you add back depreciation, we get what we call EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Keep this in mind. We will discuss EBITDA in detail later in the session. Next, interest is paid to the debt holders. After that, taxes is paid to the government. And finally, what's left in the box after paying everyone else is net earnings, which go to the shareholders. So as you can see, there is actually some thought behind how the income statement is structured in terms of the order of rights to receive cash flows. Before we move on, I want to highlight one key point. I want to highlight the subtotals before interest, which are EBIT, EBITDA, and sales. And up until this point, we have not paid the debt investors. So up until this point, any cash flow, be it EBITDA, be it EBIT, EBITDA and sales are cash flows which are due to both debt and equity holders. Because again, up until this point, we haven't paid the debt investors. And subtotals after interest, so net earnings, are only due to equity holders. When amounts are due to both debt and equity holders, we call this enterprise value. And when amounts are only due to equity holders, we call it equity value. To summarize, when you're working with EBIT, EBITDA or revenue, since these are before interest expense, they are cash flows that are due to both debt and equity holders. Hence, they form part of the enterprise value multiples and you can derive from them EV revenue, EV EBITDA and the EV EBIT multiples. Conversely, when you're working with net income, since it is after interest expense, it's due only to equity holders. Hence, it's an equity value multiple and you can derive price to earnings and price to book multiples. And the price to book multiple is typically used to value financial services companies like banks and insurers, but we'll talk about that later. Remember, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's no such thing as a price to EBIT or a price to EBITDA or a price to revenue multiple because there is a mismatch in the numerator and the denominator. And similarly, you will never see such a thing as EV over net income or EV over book value. So just remember to make sure that things are consistent when you are calculating your multiples. So which is better? One thing to note is that enterprise value and equity value multiples serve different purposes and are rarely used together. The most common enterprise value multiple is EV EBITDA and the most common equity value multiple is price to earnings. Before we discuss the differences, I want to elaborate on EV EBITDA multiple. It is the most commonly used multiple in M&A and for a good reason. Investors are most concerned with cash flow and EBITDA is a good proxy for cash flow because remember, we add back those non-cash items like depreciation and amortization when we derive EBITDA. Let's do a quick example. Say we have two companies that sell toys. Company A manufactures the toys and has lots of plant and machinery, whereas company B outsources manufacturing. 
if both companies have the same revenue and the same cost structure, which will have the higher EBIT. Company B, of course, because company A owns lots of plant and machinery, it will have higher depreciation. And then when you calculate EBIT, you deduct the depreciation so the EBIT becomes lower. So EBIT of these two companies will look very different solely because one manufactures in-house and the other outsources, yet they have the same revenue and same cost structure. So to make these two companies comparable, we add back the depreciation and amortization. And then when you look at EBITDA, both are similar. So EBITDA sort of normalizes companies which are highly capital intensive. Let's discuss the differences between EV EBITDA and price to earnings multiples. EV EBITDA values the overall business. It takes into account all the sources of funding that went into investing into assets in the business. It eliminates capital structure effects, as I showed you the problems with ROE and how ROIC solved it, and ROIC was the inverse of EV EBIT. It's ideal for comparing companies with different capital structures, non-cash items, and tax rates, as we showed how ROIC solved the problem that ROE caused, and I just explained the example of the two companies one which had a lot of depreciation and the other which had minimal depreciation. And lastly, EV EBITDA is the go-to multiple for M&A investors and private equity professionals. The PE multiple values only the equity in the company. It's distorted by capital structure as we showed the problem of ROE. And remember, RO, the inverse of ROE is the PE multiple. It's difficult to compare companies with different capital structures, non-cash items, and tax rates. And it's typically used in stock picking for personal portfolios and things like that. And PE multiples are rarely used by M&A investors and private equity professionals.